because I have to wander 40 years in the wilderness because of you. But when we are in that position, let's remember that if it wasn't them complaining, it might have been you. And how many times, even though we might be Joshua or Paul, <coughs> we're still prone to question and we're still prone to complain and doubt. So I thank God for the example of Joshua and Caleb. Bringing up this thing about Caleb. Let's remember this about Caleb. They're going into the promised land. They're dispersing the land out between their, between their tribes. Al talked about this last week in Sunday school. Caleb comes back and he says, you know what? He said, uh, I just wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Now I'm the old pappy of the group, right? Because <laughs> it's Joshua and Caleb. And, and the rest of that generation all died off. And Joshua and Caleb come. And they're able to go into the promised land. And Caleb said, I don't want the, the land that's easy. I want the mountainous area that's filled with giants. You ever catch that? He said, send me, send me there. That's where I want to go. Beloved, as we wander through the wilderness, and it might not even be my fault that I'm wandering through the wilderness, so many times I get to the point, and in our human nature, we tend to get to the point where, where we're all beat up and we're all, we're all uh, tired out because we're not resting in the reality that our God is the Lord and he desires to lead us through the wilderness, number one, with a good attitude. Number two, he desires to take us through the wilderness with strength. He desires to take us through the wilderness and say to, to, to us as his people, I will be your constant stay. I will be your strength. I will be your fortification. And when the time comes when I call you to go into the promised land, you won't need to to take a, a city that's already built, but you can take the mountain, and you can go in and not only take the mountain, but you can destroy and cast out the giants that are there, because I am your God, and I am your strength, and I will lead you, and I will guide you, and I will direct you, because I want you in the promised land, and I promise to be with you. Hmm. I promise to give this land to Abraham. I promise to give it to Isaac. I promise to give it to Jacob. Okay, Joshua and Caleb, now you went through the injustices of life, and I want you to go in to the promised land, and I want you to conquer the giants, and I want you to, to take possession of the promised land. Praise God this morning that his word hasn't changed, his truth hasn't changed, and his ability hasn't changed. But the same God that led Joshua and Caleb and the rest through the wilderness is the same God that says, I want to take you through your wilderness. I want to take you through your storms. I want to take you through your trials. And I want to give you the land that I promised you. It's the same God. Praise God this morning for that. Secondly, let's remember that as Joshua and Caleb, they went through the trial of the wilderness. They came through successful. One of our points last Sunday was the idea that Moses was led through the wilderness. And let's remember that sometimes, sometimes, beloved, we die in the wilderness. But God is still good. His strength is still ours. Amen? Moses ate of that manna. He saw those, those miracles, didn't he? Moses was blessed in many, many ways, but he didn't have the blessing of walking into the promised land, but he had the blessing of walking with the God who promised him that I will be with you. I will be your strength. I will be your comfort. I will be your stay. And so it's with that background that we come to the first chapter of, of Joshua. We left off with Moses last week. Moses is looking across. He's looking into the promised land. And God is saying, I want you to view it. I want you to see it. I want you to see it with your own eyes that it is a good land. And this is where I promised. I, I promised Jacob. It was several weeks ago, a month ago, I guess, it was that we talked about Jacob as he laid down and, and uh, he saw that vision, right? Riding from Esau, his brother. He sees that vision of that ladder or that staircase that, that stretched from earth to heaven. And he sees the, the, the protectors, the angels, the ministers 
who were ministering to him and protecting him. And he saw that. And he says, God, you know what? If you lead me in here, you protect me. You bring me back to this mountain, and surely I will give you a tenth of all that you've given me. Remember that? That was Jacob. Here he comes. That was the promised land. He walked through it. He didn't receive it as his, as his physical possession, although in his mind he knew that that would be the possession of his posterity. Surely, it says in Hebrews, had they seen or had they been so minded to go back to where they came from, they could have. But their focus was not on earthly, temporal places and things and people, but their focus was on a heavenly city that was built by their God. Their focus was on the God, that city whose builder and maker was God himself. What, what were they looking at? They were looking, maybe maybe in their mind, they were thinking of the promised Canaan land. But beloved, their true focus was on the heavenly land, though they didn't understand it like you and I might understand it. Praise God this morning that we are called by God, the same God, to come to the promised land. The next thing I'd like to say, praise God this morning, that we don't just have to walk into the promised land and say to the giants there, hey, I'm here, <laughs> I'm here now. No, but we can walk in led by God and led by His Holy Spirit. <laughs> Jesus said, as I go away, He said, I will not leave you comfortless. And that word comfortless could be interpreted orphan. I don't want to leave you as, a, as an orphaned baby on the doorstep of the enemy, but I want you to be led by my Spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They are the children of God. They are part of His family. Why? It is demonstrated by a life that is led through the wilderness, through the trials, through the storms. We heard the prayer time this morning. So many of our, of our people, so many of our congregants here today have trials and storms that they're going through, amen? And the same God that led Joshua through the, the wilderness, the same God that led Caleb through the trials of life, the same God that, that led Moses is the same God that's calling you and I to the promised land. Now the promised land, some people say that represented heaven, and it can, it might. But let's remember that when we get to heaven, there, there won't be any enemies to drive out. I think, I think the promised land more, more um, accurately depicts the Christian life. Because there's still quests. There's still conquests. There are still enemies. There's still battles to be fought. Amen? So however you view this, it's not, not worth our arguing over. But the reality is, in our, in our Christian life, we still have battles. And as Joshua met these battles, and that God was leading him. He met them realizing that Canaan was a real place for real people, and they were led there by a God who says, I will lead you. Now verse 1, Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, Moses, God's servant, is gone. Over and over and over, Moses is referred to as the servant of of God. Beloved, if we want to be a Moses in life, you know, uh, I don't know what, what Egypt looked like in your life, and I don't need to know what Egypt looked like in your life, but I know it's there, amen, because we're human. We're, we've been in Egypt, so to speak. We don't know what all that looked like. Moses now is dead. Moses is gone, but Moses was a servant of God. Moses was led from Egypt in, into the wilderness. And again, he had led from the wilderness back to Egypt. And then he's led right back to the wilderness again with, with how many people with him, right? <laughs> Complaining, bickering, backbiting uh, people. Saying, you know, we don't have enough to eat. We don't have enough to drink. God's not providing for us. And Moses continues to go back and call out to God. This was the, the, the role model that Joshua watched as he stood and he watched jo uh, Moses. Joshua looked and he watches Moses, the servant of God, as Moses is walking with God. He is teaching Joshua to walk with God. He's teaching Joshua to lead these people. And God says to Moses, he says, 
Moses, will you just get out of my way? I'm going to wipe these people out, and I'll make a greater nation of you, Moses. And Moses goes, and he says, no, God. No, God, don't do that. Don't do that. Because your enemies then will say, your God, your God wasn't able to lead you. He says, God, no, this was a servant of God. He pleads for his people before God. He comes to God and he says, God, these people are your people. They are my people. I am your servant, God. You have called me to lead these people from Egypt. I know what it's like to be in Egypt. I know what it's like to be there. I know what they experienced. I know the comforts that they had. I know the wilderness that they're going through, God. Great man. Great servant. Why? Because he understood not only where they used to be, but he understood the hardship that they were going through. Moses, the servant of God, now has passed on, and God is calling Joshua. He's calling Joshua, and he says to Joshua, Just as I was with Moses, Joshua, so will I be with you. Just as I led <coughs> Moses, just as Moses stretched his hand, stretched his rod out of the sea, Joshua, just like that, I will be with you. Joshua, you're in a few days you're going to go across this Jordan River that's at flood stage. And I'm going to expect you to walk out into the Jordan River. I want you to take the priests and I want them to walk out into that flowing river that's at flood stage. And I want them to begin to walk out in that dirty, muddy, swirling water. And I want them to walk out there. And I, just as I was with Moses, so will I be with you, Joshua. Joshua, don't forget this. You need to go into the promised land. And just as I was with Moses, I will lead you. Wasn't well, that a comfort? Because Joshua knew what was ahead of him. He is in camp beside this river. He is standing here watching it, looking at it, knowing somehow was his faith. Wait, mine would have. Mine would have. Here I am, and I'm supposed to get how many people, how many million people across this river? Is that blood set? And you expect, really, God? God says, yeah, I was with Moses. Don't forget. Just as I supplied the needs for my people when Moses was leading them, so I will provide for you as you go into the promised land. I will provide protection. I will provide safety. I will provide the need of your life. The need of the hour, the food that you need, the water that you need, the sustenance that you need. Just as I was with Moses, Joshua, so will I be with you. Every place that the sole of your foot treads upon, I will give it to you. I will, I will go before you, verse 5, so that no one is able to stand before you. All the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you, and I will not fail Saved. Do you believe that? God said that to Moses. Why? Because he meant it. That's why. <laughs> isn't that exciting? It's the same God says to each of us. And, and then you have to wonder, right? What happened? Yeah. God's people. And then it just seems like they were forsaken, doesn't it? And, and Israel was, was split in, in two. And the enemies, the Philistines would come in. And then the Babylonians came in. And one by one, we look, we look at, uh, at the time here as they come in. And then it's not long and you see the judges being raised up, right? We see the judges coming. And, and then man began to do what was right in his own eyes. And he forgot about the word of the law that should not depart from your heart. The word of the law that was never to depart from their mind. But I will cling to it. Verse 8. The book of the law should not depart from your mouth. That book of the law should not depart from your meditation, from your thought process, from your very life. But see, so many, many times we begin to separate things, right? You got this part of my life, that's my life. And this part of my, uh, of my week or my life, that's your part, God. And, and I'll do this for you and i do this for me. No, God is saying to, to Joshua here in verse 8, and that's why we picked this as our call to worship. You will meditate upon it day by day. You know what he's saying? He said, I want you to embrace the whole of your life. And I want you to allow me, Rebecca, you mentioned it this morning in prayer time. God loves to embrace us with his hug and pull us all together and hold us together. 
We're going through hardship. We're going through trials. Don't we love the feel of that embrace? I do. I, I, I look at the, the little Devin come bopping up through the, the barn the other evening, and he had, he had found a piece of glass in the back of the barn. And, and he comes running up, and he's just crying. Tears are dripping off his chin. And he's saying, Daddy, Daddy, the blood is coming out. Daddy. <laughs> the first time I think he bled very much. It wasn't a whole lot, but in his mind, it was, it was so scary. And he just wanted that embrace. Lindsay comes out and says, what's going on? I said, he, he cut himself here somehow. Well, she went to investigate and found out what happened, right? He found a piece of sharp glass. <coughs> we love that embrace. It's so comforting. But you see, God says, you know what? I don't want you after that trial. Yes, I want you to stand on your own. I want you to go in and I want you to have... Uh, Possess that land of Canaan, but I want you to allow my embrace to hold you together so you don't push me to one side and you to the other side, but you allow my everlasting arms to encompass you so that you as my people realize that I am your God and you're my people. That the book of the law would not depart from your mouth. That the book of the law would not would not leave your mind. That you would meditate upon it day and night. No matter where you were. No matter what, what you were doing. No matter what was happening. You're meditating and you're thinking about the word of God. So that you understand the truth and the reality of the word of God. <clears throat> that thou mayest view it. That you may observe to do what's written therein. For then... I will make your way prosperous, and I will make your way successful. But God's people turned away. They turned aside. They went their own way. And that's where the judges come in. God raises up a judge. The judge calls God's people back to God. Remember Gideon? Just one of the examples. And he calls the people back to God. And he says, you know, we, we can't fight this battle ourselves. He said, I want all, most of you warriors to go home. I'll go with a few. I will go with the impossibility. And God says, you know what? I love to take the impossible and make it possible. I love to take you into Canaan, and I love to show you the impossibilities of life because I, your God, am capable of dealing with the impossibilities of life. Praise God this morning for the impossibilities of life. Praise God this morning for Canaan. Praise God this morning for the wilderness. Praise God this morning for the way that God calls us to himself and asks us to allow him to show us the goodness of God in our day to day. Praise God for the fact that he is calling us to go into the promised land. And he said, I will be to you a God. I will give you the inherited land. I will give it as I promised it to your fathers. And you will be strong, verse 7, and very courageous. I want you to go in. I want you to observe my law. The same promises that I gave to Moses are the same promises I give to you. The same commandments I gave to him, I give to you. Turn not away from him. Don't turn to the right hand or to the left hand. But follow before me. Don't worry, the psalmist said, about the arrow that flieth by day. Don't worry about the devastation that comes from the enemy. But, as God says to Joshua, walk before me. Go straight before me. Do not allow a uh, life to cause you to waver. Because, God says, I want you to prosper as we allow God to help us, as we allow God in our quest of the promised land, as we allow God to lead us not only into the promised land, but as we allow him to give us the strength to meet the enemy, as we allow God to, to give us the strength to, to meet where, where he has called us to go. He has said, I want you to understand my strength is yours. And I want to help you to win the battle. We realize, we, we, we now jump, okay, towards the end of Joshua's life. You know the story of Joshua. They go in and they begin to conquer, right? 
they conquered Jericho. We had that, that wonderful story of, of Rahab and taking care of hiding the spies. We remember those stories, right? And Joshua would go in and have that great battle at, at uh, Jericho. And then you go into to a little smolten town, right? A little blink town, right? <laughs> they go into a little place called Ai, and it's considerably smaller. And they're defeated. And God says, uh, they're sinning. Remember? Yeah, we remember that story. And it's dealt with harshly. And I say, wow. I want to see him spare, right? Poor Aiken there. Made him one little mistake, right? Well, let's remember Adam and Eve made one little mistake. And that little mistake was the mistake of disobedience. It's the same thing today, isn't it? If I'm not careful. Mm -hmm. And God is saying, I want you. I want you to go before me in perfection. Walk straight before me. Go into the promised land. Don't turn to the right or to the left. We go on in, in the conquest of Canaan. And we see God's people being led by God into the promised land. We see the promised land given to them. And we see God sharing with them and leading them to victory. Chapter 24. Joshua now is coming to the end of his life. God is saying to Joshua, I want you to gather the people together. I'm still their God. They're still my people. I still have a plan for them. Beautifully, uh, now you use this again and again throughout Sunday school. And that is the idea of redemption. I am redeeming my people I am calling them to myself. I will, when the time is fulfilled, I will send my son. We celebrate that every year at the birth of Christ, at Christmas time. We don't celebrate it necessarily because it's December 25. That's why society does it. But as God's people, we celebrate the birth of Christ. Whatever time that fell on in the Jewish calendar is not my point. My point is we celebrate the birth of Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ is incarnated into the earth. In John chapter 1, verse 14, the, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and of truth. Christ is begotten into this world. He is brought into this world. Why? Because of the promise that God made to his people that I will send a redeemer. In the fullness of time, I will send forth my son. He will be born under the law. He will be born to a virgin. He will be born as a sinless son of God. And he will come to be the Messiah, the redeemer of my people. He will call them to myself. Secondly, he will call them to an understanding of who I am. He will call them and he will bring their focus and their attention to the love of God the Father who said to Joshua, go before me, walk before me, go into the promised land, don't turn to the right or to the left, but go forward. Obey me, follow me, serve me. I will send a redeemer. And so as these judges come, calling God's people back to him. Why? Because God says, I will send my redeemer through you. I will send my redeemer, not just to redeem you, but to give to the world an avenue of understanding me and of having that redeemer himself. And so the beauty of the New Testament brings us to that, that reality that as God's people in the Old Testament rejected him so many times, so Jesus comes and again, again he's rejected, amen? They're remembering God, they're remembering the promise, they're remembering that the Messiah will come, and they still remember that. And they still, some of them, still reject Christ as the Messiah, as the Redeemer. But God says to Joshua, that time is in the future. Joshua, right now, I want you to gather the people together. I want you to call them before me. I want you to call the elders of, of Israel. And Joshua does this, and he says to the people, Thus saith the Lord your God, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in the old times. Your fathers dwelt in Egypt. 
But God has called them. God has worked. And he goes back to the fathers before the flood. Several weeks ago, we talked about Noah, an individual who had that, that kingdom vision, that vision of God, the reality that he was an heir to that kingdom. And God says to, to Noah, I want you to obey me. I want you to serve me. I want you to follow me. Joshua goes right back there. He says, your forefathers before the flood. And then he brings them up to their forefathers that were in Egypt. And now he says, the same God that worked before the flood, the same God that took care of Noah, the same God that heard the cries of your fathers in Egypt is the same God that now has brought you into this promised land, into Canaan, into the quest, into the conquest, if you will, of the promised land. That same God calls to us and says, if you will follow. If you will serve me, as I sent Moses and Aaron, as I brought your fathers out of Egypt, as I heard their cry in verse 5, I brought them through the land of the Amorites. I brought them through the land. I heard about that in Sunday school this morning. God brought them through the land and brought them into the promised land. But you would not hearken to me. You built altars to Baal. You built altars to foreign gods. You built the, the golden calf in the wilderness. For the Lord is our God. He it is that brought us out of the land. Verse 17. He it is that drove out the enemies. Verse 18. Joshua says to the people, you can't do this by yourself. And they say, oh yes, we can. We will serve the Lord. And he says, no, you're going to forget about the Lord. And what does the Bible tell us? Tell us. The people served God all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that knew Joshua. And when they all died off, what happened? They began to turn away and they began to forget God. What a sad picture. But what a true picture of humanity. What a true picture of where we are when we lose sight of Joshua 1.8. Meditate on the law of God. Don't turn from it to the right hand or to the left. Give thyself wholly to the meditation of the scripture. Think about it day and night. Don't turn to it from the right hand or to the left hand, but go straight before when God says it, beloved. We need to believe it. And the people say, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua says to them, he says to them, I want you to know that as God's people he wants to lead you. He wants to direct you. He wants to bring you to the place where you know who he is. The last several weeks, we closed up each week in Hebrews chapter 11. I want to go there again. Why? Because it was the faithful ones, who, some of the faithful ones who are written here in chapter 11 of Hebrews. So many of the Israelites died and they're forgotten. But some of the faithful are written about here. Many of the heroes of faith, they're not named here towards the end of the chapter. By faith they did this, and by faith they did that. By faith they forsook, Moses forsook Egypt. May I say, by faith, doesn't say it here. But by faith they went forward and they stepped into the Jordan River. By faith they walked across the Jordan River, knowing that, that just as the waters separated, they could come back together again, right? And what happens if I'm in the middle of that, of that raging river on that? But by faith they walked forward. By faith they went into the promised land. By faith they said, God, I will go and I will conquer by your strength and by your power. By, by your, your enabling hand, I will go forward and I in obedience will follow you. By faith they forsook what was behind and by faith they set their gaze on the eternal reality that God's truth was real. It was forever and it would never be altered or changed because it was true. God's word is based forever in the truth and therefore it can't be altered. It can't be amended. Because it's the truth. It will not be because God's saying, I want to deliver you from the hand of the enemy. And I want to bring you to the place where you understand that I, your God, just as I led your forefathers, 
just as I led those on the other side of the flood, just as I led those uh, from Egypt into the promised land, just as I was working through the judges and through the kings and through the prophets and through the seers, and just like I was working in the life of the, the disciples and the apostles and the early martyrs and the early church fathers, just so, just like that, I have worked and I will work and I continue to work in the life of my people today. Let's praise him today. Let's bow our heads for the closing prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning, we thank you for the example of those who had a vision of what it was to be an heir of your kingdom. We thank you that we're no longer strangers and foreigners from your covenant. But we have been brought nigh, we've been brought close, we've been brought in. And just as I can scoop up my little boy and wipe away the, the bleeding blood from his cup finger so you want to pick us up and wrap us up in your love and send us forth with your with your strength. You want to fill us with yourself. You don't want to leave us orphaned, but you want to fill us to lead us and direct us with your spirit. Strengthen us for the journey ahead, Heavenly Father. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what it will look like. We don't need to know God, but we know who you are. We know that you not only hold the future, but you hold each of us in your arms. And we ask you, Heavenly Father, to continually embrace us, that we could meditate upon your word day and night, that we would not let it go, that we would not forsake it, that we would not forget it, that you would, you would continue to lead us and that we would allow you to lead us, not only into the promised land, but through the wilderness, in the quest and in the conquest of life, Heavenly Father, we pray that we would continue to submit to your unerring hand. Guide us, strengthen us, and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is 727. Faith is the victory. Let's stand together as we...